I know of one other woman in my space. I know some women who are in construction, um, who run construction businesses or construction supply. But when it comes to sort of being in the space of sustainable housing and material design, I only know of one other woman. This is Mind the Ceiling, a show about trailblazing women who are shattering barriers. These are the candid conversations that dig into what the journey to finding purpose and climbing to the top of industries is like. All of the victories, hurdles, bumps and bruises, and celebrations along the way, and the tools you can use to be the next ceiling breaker. I'm your host, Tamara Lane. My guest today is Tata Aton, president of Jack Rabbit Development, a startup in the renewables and construction space, an industry that is highly saturated by men. But Tata's track record for breaking ground started early. She graduated from high school by the age of 16 and was the first person to receive both a law degree and a master's in legal studies from Arizona State University in the same year and has gone on to be an attorney in Colorado and the Navajo Nation. And she's now a founder of a sustainable startup finding a solution to affordable housing. And this is how she describes her journey to finding purpose. Self-reflection, hyphenated word. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. And why? Oh, uh, well, you know, I had the privilege of doing an outward bound um, experience. And during that time, we spent three days in the woods by ourselves. And so it really helped me to to reflect at that time upon myself. I was 16 at the time. And the more that I've gone through life, it's really, I've really focused on, you know, what, what is my responsibility? What am I doing? And not being judgmental of others and instead being judgmental of myself and how I can improve myself. And so that's really driven home my purpose as well by just spending time focusing on what makes me happy and what I'm passionate about and uh, where I get my sort of spark from. What would you say your purpose in life is? Oh, wow. That is a big question. And I would say my purpose in life is caring for the world and caring for our generations to come and making a better place for them so that we have clean air and to breathe, clean water to drink and clean food to eat. Why is that important to you? Well, as you know, I have uh, two little girls. So I have others that are coming behind me and I want them to be able to have the same type of beautiful world that I grew up in. And uh, if we don't start making changes, they're not gonna be able to have the same type of experiences like snorkeling and seeing beautiful coral reefs or going out camping and seeing all the amazing um, you know, wildlife that's out there or even just having gardens within our own communities. And so it's important to me that My children's children have a beautiful world. And Tata stuck to that, making sure that the generations that followed her would inherit the same earth she fell in love with. Her current job as president of Jackrabbit Development reflects that purpose. Oh, Jackrabbit Development has sort of grown. Um, When we started off, we were really focusing on trying to build houses. And what we realized was that we were never going to get the buildings built because we really needed to be on the design side. So it's grown into more of a design firm, a licensed architect firm as well. And uh, it's kind of grown out of this idea of just wanting to provide housing for people. Um, And particularly in Indian country, as you know, Tamara, you've been out there, you've seen the living conditions that people were in. And I grew up knowing about that and thinking, well, you know, there's technology out there that can change the world and change their lives and their quality of life. And we just need to bring that into our communities um, with the lack of education and experience and the outer world and what's out there, you know, trying to bring that in. And so it's kind of grown and now it's become even more of a holding company in some sense so that we are starting this manufacturing unit uh, doing with sustainable construction materials and Um, You know, it's really been good to be open-minded in our company because, you know, if I had stuck with the, oh, we're going to just do building, I would never be where we are today. But in being flexible and being able to sort of zig and zag when I needed to, it's allowed us to really grow into different, different arenas that we hadn't first envisioned when I started the company. 
But you have also had some huge accomplishments with this. Can you explain a few of those? Um, yeah, so one of our biggest ones right now is working with the Navajo EPA and we're designing an off-grid sustainable building. And so it'll unify their five different departments that have been spread out across the Navajo Nation back into a unified campus and bring together the agency. And it will show all of these sustainable features such as, as high insulation and energy efficiency, edible and productive landscaping, gray water conservation. Um, so we're really excited to get to work with an agency that actually, you know, supports these types of values and um, help them reunify because they were a bit disjointed. And so when we first started, it was just one department in one building. And as we started going and we did more and more work for them, they said, oh, we really like what you're doing. And we kept growing and they said, well, why don't we do this for everyone and bring you back together? And I said, great, let's do it. So it's been but really exciting. And, but this is also something that's, you know, new, right? Like this development that you're doing is shattering ceilings itself. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I guess it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I'm a little more modest. I mean, people do passive housing and solar housing and there are now buildings, you know, in Seattle, there's a building that's completely sustainable as well. So it's not completely new, but uh, when it comes to doing it in Indian country, it really kind of is. And um, when it comes to a woman leading the projects, it definitely is. Though modest, Tata's story is just as impactful, if not more, than hearing about where she is now. Let's go back to square one, high school. My father had been told he needed to go to boarding school. My great-grandfather actually survived the Carlisle boarding school in Pennsylvania. So he was removed from his parents at a young age, shipped off to boarding school and told he couldn't be Indian. Um, and so that assimilation process and conditioning encouraged my dad that I needed to go to boarding school for some reason, but like, you know, a, a college prep school, not just a, a assimilation um, school. And so I had the privilege of going to a boarding school, actually the seventh oldest in the nation, Washington College Academy, out in the, the sticks of Tennessee, the hills of Tennessee and the Appalachians. And um, it was a really diverse school. So we had a mixture of local students who were day students and international students. So I had the privilege of getting to know people from all around the world. I still have friends who are in Korea and Spain and Thailand and all sorts of different countries. Um, and, uh, you know, being in those situations of not having access to your parents or going home every day to your parents really created a situation where some of my best friends are still the ones from my high school, um, because we just had, you know, bonding time that we would not have had had we been separated at three o'clock, four o'clock when the buses went home. Um, and so that was a really wonderful privilege for me to get to, to be involved in. Um, there wasn't as much access though, so we didn't have as much access to things as other schools might have had. Um, but what we did have was a really good support network of people there and um, helping to encourage us to learn about other people's cultures, be you know friends with people from other cultures and uh, really being exposed to things I wouldn't have been exposed to at just a normal day school. That's incredible. I mean, it's a great opportunity, but also had to probably have its challenges as well. Um, how did being there shape you and get you ready for, like, did it start kind of getting you excited about certain things that you're like, ah, oh, this is what I want to pursue? No, <laughs> no, <it didn't. laughs> no, um, I graduated high school at 16. So, you know, I was still really figuring out just being a person and being, uh, you know, what I was trying to do. Um, so no, it really wasn't until later and after I left school that it really started to focus me about education really was important, you know, working a full-time job, being a hostess or whatever at a low, a low paying job was not going to cut it for me. Um, but it did help me to be curious about the world. And so in some sense, I guess it conditioned me, but it also helped me to be really independent. I have now multiple questions, but first, wait, you graduated at 16? Yes. Yeah, I did. Um, I had the privilege. So sadly, because I had gone to boarding school, when I got home in the summers, I didn't really know people. And so a free way of getting to meet people was to go to summer school. 
So in seventh, right after seventh grade, I started going to summer school in high school, like taking high school classes. And because of that, it allowed me to get in under the credits of 18 credits to graduate that were different than the other classes if I had started later. So um, actually taking advantage of free school in the summer really helped me to accelerate through my education. That's incredible. And um, where is home away from boarding school? Where did you grow up? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, I've lived in a lot of different states and a lot of different countries. So I was born in Colorado, but then we lived in Tennessee, Pakistan, Texas, Germany, uh, Nebraska, North Carolina, New Mexico, California, Australia, England. Um, where else have I lived? California, Arizona. Uh, now I'm in St. Paul. And so it's really hard to say where home is. Um, right now, it's just where my kids are and where my heart is at this point. Well, it's funny because I was going to ask you what the challenge is for that, but it seems like you found a way to utilize that traveling and um, going from place to place. How did that shape you and how did you use that as a tool for you? Well, I think it shaped me in, again, being open-minded and being flexible and being willing to, you know, somewhat say, okay, well, this is what I planned. So I planned to do this, but that's not working. And being willing to let go of plans and just sort of go with the flow of things rather than being really stuck in like, this is how it has to be, or this is the, the mindset. Um, I believe it also really helped me to diversify in where I see value in people because I get the feeling that sometimes we don't value people the same way from other countries and from other parts of the world. And so I've really been able to um, see the humanity across the world in people and uh, expand those networks, right? Like knowing that I've got people that I can call if I end up in Australia or end up over in Asia is, is, is a good thing. It, it's comforting. It makes the world seem somewhat smaller um, and, and really more connected. Tata's unconventional path in completing high school taught her incredible life lessons, ones that are still serving her today. It also allowed her to forge a path that reflected her own wants and needs, something we sometimes lose sight of when we're trying to get ahead. And so you left high school at 16, which still blows my mind. Uh, and what did you do next? Were you applying uh, for college at that point? Like, am I quite, I like, I, so, I probably should have, uh, that would have been the smart thing to do, but, um, I actually was trying to pursue a fencing career because it was sort of sudden. I didn't start getting into high school thinking, oh, I'm going to graduate at 16, but the school that I was at was, um, sort of having some difficulties financially. And they said they, they were going to wind down. And so I said, oh, I better hurry up and graduate with my friends because otherwise I'm going to have to go find new friends at a new school. Don't want to do that. So I left and moved to Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska, because I was pursuing my fencing career at that time. There was a, an amazing fencing coach there. And I got there and literally that week he told me that he was going to move to Denver, Colorado. And I thought, okay. Uh, you knew I was moving here. I have literally just spent all of my high school savings to get here to Nebraska. And now I'm kind of stuck. And I had fallen in love with a boy who's unfortunately died now, but my high school sweetheart and I had moved out there and got an apartment. And so I spent a year uh, working. I uh, think that you were more than just training for fencing, right? You were an Olympic hopeful. Yes. Yeah, I was. I was I, definitely trying to, to make it to the Olympics and fencing for a woman's saber. That's incredible. And again, it takes so much focus. And I'm, I'm already noticing a trend here with um, your just passion and like laser focus on what you want. Um, but, and also your willingness to take some risks to do it. So what did, when you were fencing, what, what did you learn from that, that you've taken with you? Hard work that it takes a lot of hard work, uh, that sometimes it's painful, but it's worth it. Um, getting hit or slapped by a saber does not feel good, uh, but you know, getting to walk away with a victory is, is definitely worth it. Um, and also self-reliance, you know, when you're out there on a fencing strip, it's just you. You can't go back and say, oh, well, that person missed the pass or that person didn't make a goal like you can in soccer or other team sports, you know, it's really relying upon you. 
And if you aren't up to the task or doing your best, then you have nobody to blame but yourself. And so that really helped me to learn to take responsibility for my own actions and to, again, put in the, the dedication that it takes to be you know, a champion. And Tata would channel that energy into her college years, recognizing the importance of education. You said that you had a school in mind that you wanted to go to. Um, what school was that and why? Well, originally I wanted to go to Dartmouth and they rejected me. So that was my first big rejection of, oh, okay. Um, and now looking back, I know, I think I was just sort of ahead of their time um, and what I was trying to accomplish and what I wanted to do. Cause I, when I interviewed, I was really focused on talking about nutrition, nutritious foods and how I wanted to focus on learning about the medicinal and um, you know, the caloric values essentially of foods in order to create really healthy recipes and for people because there is, you know, medicine and food and that's popular now, but 20 years ago, that was sort of ahead of my time um, as I seem to always be. Uh, but then I ended up focusing just on where I could stay put for three years, four years, because I knew it was going to require me to, to live someplace. And up until going to college, I had never lived someplace for four years. It had always been moving, moving, moving. And so I focused on, hey, what cool town can I see myself living in for four years? So I ended up at Asheville, North Carolina, because I had been close to that at the boarding school. Asheville was always that cool place we went to on day trips and, and for soccer tournaments. I said, okay, I can be there for four years and, and dedicate myself to being in this community for four years. And what'd you focus on there? Were you able to focus on nutrition or did you have to do something else? No, I definitely did not do that by the time I got to Asheville. Um, after that, and after kind of being rejected and like, oh, if even the top schools don't think that that's a smart thing, you know, I'll focus on something else. And uh, I ended up focusing on sociology. And it was really by chance, I happened to be at the line in the cafeteria. And I met um, one of my favorite professors, his name is Dr. Pitts. And he was this very, very tall black man, and ended up talking to him just about my life in general. And he said, Well, I really think you would enjoy sociology, Tata, because, you know, I've always been, you know, curious about the rest of the world, given my travels and in, you know, experiences with other people. And he said, I think this will allow you to sort of engage in your curiosity about things and um, focus on where you're, what you're talking about, which is you see these issues going on in the world and you want to come up with solutions to them. And sociology is kind of a great place to do that. So um, I, I focused on that for the majority of my time. And I almost got a, um, a minor in business Business. So I took a lot of business classes in undergrad, but I didn't actually, you know, get a, a degree in that. However, my dad had said consistently, you have to take some accounting classes, Tata, you have to do this. Like the one thing you've got to do is take accounting classes. And then of course you get into accounting and it's like, oh, well, maybe I'll take this other business class and I'll take this marketing class. And, you know, why not just keep taking classes and not have to get a minor or really focus on the paper side of it, but get the education part out of it. And I I honestly could not be more thankful that my dad, that I actually listened to that advice from my dad, um, that I needed to take accounting <laughs> classes. Uh, because while I'm not a master of accounting um, or a master of my spreadsheets, it at least helps me have a, a, a basic understanding of what's going on in accounting. And it's pretty integral to being an entrepreneur. I think that's amazing to point out too, because I think as I've even grown, one of the things I realize is that um, some of those skills that uh, you need in order to just function, we overlook a lot, um, mm -hmm. like balancing our, our bank account or any of these, like, you know, they're, they're skills that you need. Um, and you just kind of jump into the stuff that looks you know, sexy and shiny. And without that base and that foundation, you can miss something really important. Um, but so with all of that, what then got you interested in law? Um, well, it was really about the credibility. I know. Well, okay. Now I guess I should st step back. Everyone when I was young told me I should be a lawyer because I like to debate. 
Um, and a lot of the people that I admired who had changed the world in ways like Thurgood Marshall or Mahatma Gandhi, um, Martin Luther King, they were all lawyers. And so I suddenly realized that there was this sort of credibility, but this type of thinking that they were learning that allowed them to make some big changes within the communities that they served. And so um, I sort of set out to say, okay, well, I don't really wanna be a practicing lawyer, but if I get a law degree, maybe people will take me more seriously in what I'm talking about. Cause you know, I'd already been rejected by Dartmouth saying like, you know, what you're talking about with nutrition is, is way far granola-ish for us. And, you know, talking about sustainability, um, people really looked at me as though I'd grown two heads, you know, 15 years ago when I was talking about sustainability and how important it was that we start getting ahead of the game. And so to me, it was if I get a law degree, then maybe people will take me more seriously because I had sort of looked at the fact that there were a lot of people who had MBAs and I'd actually applied to Northwestern to do like a joint MBA JD. They also rejected me. Um, and so <laughs> I said, okay, well, the MBA is out there and it's obviously a great degree, but there's something about being a lawyer that just takes you to that next level. And my dad is a doctor. And so I really kind of saw that like, you know, people put doctors and lawyers and, and business people up on these sort of pedestals and saying like, oh, they must really know what they're talking about. And I just really wanted to gain that same sort of credibility of saying like, yeah, I, I kind of do know what I'm talking about. You you know? Well, and so I actually met you when you were in law school. So I know where you were, but tell me about why you chose to go to ASU. Oh, well, that was a really happens. It, it, I had been rejected by Northwestern. The 2008 recession had happened and I actually was looking at a magazine and the Native People's Magazine and there was an advertisement for this Indian legal program, the MLS program, the master's program. And so I said, well, maybe I could get a law degree in one year that would not require me to do the three years since I don't want to be a practicing attorney um, and get that credibility. And so I called up this advertisement and talked to Anne Marie and said, you know, this is kind of what I want to do. And she said, well, I think it would be a good fit for you to come here and, and be in our program. So I you know, this was maybe October that I looked into it and I packed my bags the day after New Year's and drove out with my brother to Arizona. Um, and then once I got into the program, into the master's program and really started looking at the Indian legal program there, I said, well, this is really um, a, a great network to be in. And really I discovered that the master's didn't have as much um, reliability as I thought it did, or at that point, credibility, no one really knew what the master's in legal studies was. And so I then realized that if if I really wanted to get where I wanted to be, I was just going to have to go for a doctorate and get the doctorate as well. So I ended up staying, staying there. And, um, you know, part of that was being connected into a Native community. I had grown up uh, almost always being the only person of color in the room um, until going to that boarding school. But pretty much usually the only person um, with brown skin and definitely the only native. And so once I got into a community where there were a lot of other natives, it was it was really um, enlightening and really sort of like, okay, this is what I've been trying to do. You know, I've always been talking about American Indians, but I'm the only one being the American Indian. So it's nice to finally be around other American Indians and be welcomed into that community. So it really became sort of a home in that sense. Authenticity. Tata found a network by authentically connecting with people who have similar or shared heritage. You know, I was Indian and I could be Indian and that there were other people out there supporting Indians and wanting to do work within their own communities as well. And so it just provided a great friendship basis um, in one hand. Um, and then also grow or getting out into the work environment, it helped me realize, you know, how important those networks are, right? And so I went to school with a bunch of people who are now all advising, you know, leaders across the nation, tribal leaders across the nation. And so that really helped um, as well to to know that there are people out there that I can call on and say, hey, do you know how to get a hold of this person? Do you know what's going on here? Um, that type of situation. And well, my dad and I had a debate about that this, literally just this weekend. And I said, well, I don't, if I'd gone to Cornell Law School, I don't know if I'd have those same networks. And he's like, well, the Ivy Leagues would probably still put you in the same spot. Maybe they would have, um, but I don't know if I could call as many 
people, my friends in those networks as I literally can now. And to me, that that seems to be more important when it boils down to doing business as opposed to just having a fancy degree from a fancy school. Hey, everybody, before we dive in, I want to give a content warning. This next section talks about an emotionally abusive relationship. If this is sensitive to you, skip ahead a minute. Now, back to Tata's story. I look back now and I think, I wish I would have cultivated my network better um, or even had a strategy on how to to go about it, right? And how to stay in touch and how to really massage the the friends and the colleagues that I had. And I, I'm still learning, right? But how did you do that when you were in law school and then growing out of that? Badly <laughs> is how I did it. Uh, I was actually in a pretty emotionally abusive relationship at the time that was super controlling. So I wasn't allowed to wear makeup. I wasn't allowed to go out and socialize with the other with my other you know friends at law school um, because I was you know accused of cheating all the time if I did that. So it was really badly actually, and um, that is something that I definitely know that I missed out on because had I gone out and cultivated those relationships more, gone out on the Fridays when they were going out to these bars and drinking, um, which sounds kind of silly, but the reality is, is that's where you develop those friendships, right? Um, or been allowed to really participate in more extra extracurricular activities through the school, uh, that probably would have helped me a little bit more. And so I look back and think, why didn't I drop that guy sooner? You know, <laughs> but at the same time, um, I've been able to, you know, because people know me now, I can reach out at conferences or reach out through Facebook and just start to establish those relationships more and look back and say, hey, we went to law school together. Let's connect. Um, so I do a lot of that, you know, right now through Facebook and LinkedIn. Actually, I was just in an alliances conference meeting the other day and a, a guy that I went to law school was there and I said, oh, I went to law school with you, David. And I need to connect with you because he's doing trusts and SEC stuff and certifications. So let's let's work together. Um, so it at least put my face out there, but I wish I had been, you know, more active is the best way to say that. Well, and you're, so you're doing that now and we'll touch on that again. Cause it's like the entrepreneur's journey, right? <laughs> but, um, when you talk about, I, I want to ask you, and if you don't want to answer, that's fine. You answer whatever you're comfortable with, but for anyone, I feel like throughout our lives, we can find ourselves in situations like you just spoke to. And for anyone who does find themselves in that situation, what sort of looking back, what sort of advice do you wish you would have either known for yourself or you could tell yourself? Oh, I wish I could tell myself that you're worth it. You, you know, that this, this isn't you um, because it was a very slow, it was like the, the drop, right? The Chinese torture drop of it starts slowly and then it keeps building and building. Um, and so honestly, what I wish that I, had been able to access and something I've discussed with other women who have been in this situation is like a red flags handbook because you know there were multiple things that happened that I think well this is this is really weird and I would go to literally go to the internet and try to find things like are other people talking about these types of situations and there really wasn't a succinct spot or or sort of you know um manual that you could access uh they have like the power and control wheel and i had been a domestic violence advocate in turn when i was in college or yeah in college so it wasn't as though i didn't know what domestic violence is but the reality is that you you really kind of think of it as being that physical abuse well he's not hitting me so it's not that bad, right? But those other things that are really being detrimental to your self-esteem, I mean, it took me years to get over the, the self-esteem issue that had, had developed through that. Um, and so I wish that there was a manual out there that we could put together. And if you know other women who wanna put that together to, so that other women can go out and say, well, okay, he doesn't say exactly this, but it's sort of like this and it's sort of causing the same effect um, so that we can assure other women that it's not just them. Thank you for sharing, because I think it's important as we shed light on this, that like we, we look at people who are very successful and we think, ah, oh, everything went perfect from start to finish. Right. And we don't realize that there's so much in between and so much in the journey mm -hmm. um, and that we're not alone in this journey. Right. Um, and so the more we kind of bring that to light, the the better it is for people 
everyone and every woman, a woman of every age. So thank you. Um, and so I want to touch again now. So you, after, um, law school, you kept saying you didn't want to practice, but I think you did start practicing. I did. <laughs> I did pretty much immediately start practicing. You know, um, I had a child my last semester of law school, and I actually had to drop out of law school in the last year because I had a really, really tough pregnancy. I was throwing up literally 14 to 15 times a day. Um, just I, I couldn't hold anything down nor focus on what was happening. So I dropped out. And then uh, at that same time, you know, I really kind of was breaking up with the father of my child, who was the person who was emotionally abusive to me. And so I was sort of placed in this situation where he wasn't paying child support. I had a really young child to feed. And the only way to do that was to kind of fall back into what I'd been trained to do, which was to be a lawyer. So I ended up taking a job uh, at a legal services um, organization, a nonprofit. And it was a really good experience for me. But at the same time, it definitely wasn't what I had planned to do. But, you know, again, when you have somebody relying on you to, to be fed every day um, and to be cared for, you kind of have to make those sacrifices for them. It is incredible how much strength a person can have we all find ourselves in difficult places and have to make difficult choices that affect both our personal lives and career. After practicing law, Tata made another choice to become a prosecutor. Here's how it happened. I did last year. That was actually due to COVID. So, <laughs> you oh. know, I, um, yeah, I, I've been thinking I should write a, a story about this and get a movie made, but I actually got, um, assigned to do a murder defense case about two years ago. I was leaving the gym. I got this call and said, hey, you have a, a hearing tomorrow. You have done, been pro bono because in Navajo Nation, we are required to do pro bono work for criminal defense. So I ended up driving all night to a jail and um, working with this client. And because I'd been through now an escalation of criminal defense cases and culminating in this murder case, I was able then when COVID hit and sort of saw what was coming down the pipeline and said, oh, you know, it seems as though there's going to be cash flow issue coming in and projects are going to get stalled when our country shut down. I immediately said, oh, let me take a job because someone called up and said, hey, we're, we, do you know anyone who would want to do prosecute? prosecutorial work. And I said, oh, that's me. I'll take it. <laughs> and so, again, one of those things you do in, in a sacrificial moment, right? I knew I needed to feed my family and I knew I needed to keep the electricity on. So I said, okay, I can do criminal or I can do the prosecutor work. I know how to do defense work. And that's pretty much the same, the same area of law. And so at least I had kind of had that background and then got to be in it. And it was also really eye-opening and really one of those uh, amazing spots to be at because right after I took that, the George Floyd incident happened. And so, you know, here I am being a prosecutor and getting to realize the, the amount of power that a prosecutor has to make decisions about who they're going to prosecute and how they're going to prosecute them. And I don't feel as though I would have ever had that experience otherwise or really been eye-opened to the way that the, the police interact with the prosecution and the way that things get set up. Um, and so it, was, it really helped me to, to one, see the flaws in our justice system and to understand why there are so many like loopholes that, that people get through and why certain people aren't charged the way that they are charged. Uh, but it also helped me to understand you know, the, the power of people like me, people of color being in those positions and able to help their people because I was able to then as a prosecutor take a much more humanitarian stance towards people versus like, oh, well, you're you're an alcoholic, so I'm just going to keep charging you in a criminal way and not deal with the fact that you're dealing with this, this uh, essential mental health issue that's been causing you to want to be an alcoholic or to be an alcoholic and not deal with the holistic um, solution. And so, you know, it was a really wonderful experience. So you were doing defense work. When did you start um, your corp your company, Jackrabbit? Uh, in 2017, I started the company. Uh, but, you know, I've always maintained my law degrees. That was one thing that I was also smart about was not giving up my law licenses. So I'm still licensed in Navajo, still licensed in Colorado. I'm about to be licensed in Arizona. 
Um, and so a lot of that was the fact that, you know, I wasn't taking on clients actively. I was sort of getting clients passed to me doing entrepreneurial stuff, like helping them set up nonprofits. But because I maintain that license, you know, you can't, you can't turn down the pro bono work when it gets assigned to you. Um, and so it just kind of got thrown into me and it, it was at the worst time too. I was in the process of trying to raise this money for a factory. It was certainly not what I needed to be doing at that time, but that client that I, I was helping and I'm still trying to help because he's locked up in the federal system right now. Um, you know, it was a really good experience for me to be reminded that like there are other ways of helping people that aren't just through the business side, but, you know, helping them fight these legal cases or helping them stand up in court. Um, that matters. It really does matter. So it has really been an honor to also get to to help people in the legal system. In fact, last night on the way back, I was watching that movie um, that it's called Just Mercy. And it came out about the guy uh, Alan, down in Alabama, you know, and um, watching, oh, yeah. uh, you know, really reminds me that like, yeah, that a lot of the, what's happening does happen in the criminal system matter. And, you know, once you've got that record established, it, it really follows you for the rest of your life and it can really hinder you. So how do we help people get fair trials? How do we make sure that people aren't unjustly accused of things? Um, and, and being able to say that I've done that is, I guess, kind of a badge of honor, you know, knowing that Thorogood Marshall started in the same way. It's kind of cool. But you're right now, I mean, you are working on two gigantic issues, right? Like how do we solve the sustainable and um, kind of just housing issue in the legal system? Um, it's, they're, they're both gigantic. I don't know how you balance them both. Um, but when it comes to your company and like that, that journey of not only being a leader, being the founder, being the CEO, but also then, you know, growing it and raising capital, how, how do you manage that? Like, what's the most important tool in your toolbox that you're going to? Uh, my law degree, <laughs> honestly, it's the most important tool in my toolbox. It's what's allowed me to bring a lot of benefit to people. Um, even in this NEPA project, I've been able to utilize my law training and the law experience and the ex experience and knowledge I have from that to really benefit projects that I have, um, being able to help us review contracts or draft up contracts and proposals, those types of things. So it, it really has been almost the, the underlying tool for everything that I do. And I never expected that um, when I started all of this, that I would continually go back to my law training in order to help me uh, excel forward. But the reality is, is that that is what's allowing me to excel forward. It is what gets me in the door a lot more often um, because I can say, well, I'm a, a licensed attorney. And so, yeah, that's that's the biggest tool I have, unfortunately. And right now I balance it by, um, you know, where is the cash flow? So, you know, being as I still have two children to feed and um, actually I saw a lot about uh, Damon John's journey. And so following him and being like, you're right, sometimes I need to focus on my side hustle and doing my side hustle, because had I not had, for instance, the prosecutorial job come in when I did, I don't know if I could have sustained my company through that time and being able to, to move forward. And so having multiple side hustles has really also helped to sustain me. And I, I have to balance it, you know, as far as like, what, how many hours can I put in today getting paid, um, doing the, the paid hourly work? And then how can I focus and go back to what I need to do uh, to keep pushing the jobs forward and pushing our company forward? So but that's a, amazing to me because you're, you're building gigantic buildings and a manufacturing company and still doing a side hustle that, you know, helps through those, these times, because these times are crazy, especially through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um, we spoke earlier about alliances and building network. How, talk to me about that in this journey as, you know, as you're building your company and as you're raising capital. Um, yeah. So I, the, the networking, again, is just so important, but one of my, my good friends and a colleague that I work with, Wanda Lord, she had told me a couple of years ago that you know, businesses do business with people and people do business with people, right, versus businesses doing business with businesses. Um, and so once I kind of wrapped my head around that, I was able to really 
look at, well, who are my colleagues that I turn to and what are their different skills? And so we created something called our own Reliance Alliance where we, we had what we would call friends in other businesses who were doing amazing work and said, well, look, we could probably all sort of benefit each other because it's one thing for me to go, hey, Tamara, I'm awesome. But it's quite another when Wanda Lord tells you, hey, Todd is awesome right? Like that makes a big difference having other advocates out there for you. And so we really help to grow each other's businesses by doing that, by saying, well, I know this person over here who does really good work and they'll deliver on what they say they'll deliver on, because that's a lot of what we see consistently is that businesses will get jobs and then they don't deliver or they don't do a good job. And so being able to call on people that we know do a good job and bring them into those projects has really helped us to go after other projects and grow in that that space. And so being able to promote others. And a lot of that, I read this book, I had this random girl asked me about a dress once in a grocery store. And then she said, Oh, well, you should read this book. It's called The Go Giver. And it really talked about, you know, putting other people's interests at, at the front of what you do. And when you focus on serving others and the broader people you serve is that how you value yourself, then it really does, you know, speak to the, hey, if you're always just self-serving, it's not going to, it's not going to go well. But if you're serving others and you're helping others to grow, then they think about you when they have a project. So someone else will remember, oh yeah, Tata helped me get that deal. So now I'm going to go back to her when we need something. And that's literally what is happening. So I get someone like, hey, you should go work with this person. Let me give you their contact. And then when they need something, they're like, hey, you should call on Jackrabbit to go do this. They can they can do these things for you. So it's been really wonderful in that sense. Um, but to remember that, right? That like, we're really friends here. We're really humans who are just trying to all make a living and that, you know, we can collaborate, not see each other as competition because a lot of times I feel like women are, are almost like, society pushes that we should be competing with each other when really if we would join together in our networks we can help lift each other up a lot faster than if we see each other as competition and so i've really taken that to heart in how i work with people um and saying like look if you're doing the same thing that's great because if we get more people to do this then we both have more work versus oh that person's stepping on my toes and i don't like it um and so that's really made a big difference in how i approach people uh, and how I continue to engage with people, you know, taking the time to ask people about how their day is, how is their family, what's going on in your life beyond just work. So not always just jumping into, here's my pitch, here's my work, let's just talk about that. But like, no, are you having a good day? What are you struggling with right now? How can I help you in what you're struggling with? Those types of things, they make a difference sometimes if you just really take the time to ask someone versus that superficial, hey, how are you? How's the weather? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, the small talk. <laughs> when we're first starting out in cultivating relationships, it's so hard to break past these questions and connect with people. But Tata's got some advice on that. How do you go about growing your network? I've relied a lot on LinkedIn recently. Actually, for the past three years, I've been majorly growing in LinkedIn. And that, again, I think is that connectivity. So, you know, I'll connect with someone, I'll see what they're kind of into, I see what kind of posts they do, and then I reach out and um, connect that way. And so randomly, it's through LinkedIn, but a lot of it is also through the people I already know. So, you know, asking them, do they know someone who works over here or calling on them to say, hey, um, I'm trying to work on this project. Do you know anything about it? Those types of things has really been helpful. And um, going out to conferences and actually showing up and being present and not just constantly on my phone or constantly, you know, hoping to pitch things, but just hanging out and being genuine with people and ver not versus like, oh, can I get a business card or I just want to connect with you, but um, more like, hey, what are you into? You know, what what are your hobbies? And asking people questions. I mean, Dale Carnegie nailed it. You know, like a hundred years ago, the two things that people really like is to hear their name and uh, to be asked questions about themselves. Because when you actually genuinely care about learning about somebody else, you know, then they genuinely start to open up and. And it's amazing when you actually take the time to learn about someone, all those things that you didn't know, right? And then it's like, oh, wait, we have these mutual 
you know, acquaintances or these mutual interests or these mutual experiences and we can connect at a human human level on that. And that really starts to develop those relationships that really helped grow or have helped grow my business. And getting to know people on a human level solidifies your networks and helps us see people for who they are. You mentioned something to me the last time we spoke that I thought was really incredible and a a powerful characteristic that's helped you along the way. Um, Can you talk to me about what that is and why you think it's powerful? Is that about being transparent? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so I mean, transparency, right. I think a lot of us and and you had even talked earlier, right. We don't hear about the ups and downs of the journey. We just hear about the success. And so being transparent has allowed people to help me when I really needed help versus acting like I had my, all my shit together, excuse my French, but you know, acting like the whole show was together, um, has not always served a purpose when being, willing to talk about the issues that I'm going through or being willing to struggle with somebody else and being open about that has allowed them to then help me like asking for help or being transparent. Hey, I'm having issues with getting this done um, has allowed people to then assist me that they would not have been able to do had I not been transparent with what was happening. And so being again, right, being just genuine about what's happening allows people to connect to you a lot more. And it goes back to what I said earlier is that people do business with people. And so showing your true colors really helps a lot of the time versus trying to be someone you're not. Let's embrace being transparent with each other and being able to grow from each other's abilities and lessons. That's the whole point of this podcast. It's about being open and honest, unfiltered and undeterred. If you could tell yourself anything at 15, what would it be? Go network a lot more, learn to play golf and start to appreciate your body. Frankly, you know, I got a lot of body shame growing up. I was always told I needed to eat well and stay physically active and that I was too round, too big, whatever. Um, in that I spent a lot of time not appreciating my body and not appreciating truly what I had because I was sort of shamed for it. And so, you know, reminding myself that I was beautiful, um, but also go learn to play golf. And that is it. The unfiltered, undeterred journey of Tata Atone, a passionate trailblazer leading the sustainable housing industry. And now it's time for the Mind the Ceiling Mindful Minute. With Anika Uden, our podcast's associate producer and potentially your company's next CEO. Anika, take it away. First question is, what book changed your life or impacted you the most? People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. Totally changed my life. Also confirmed a lot of the things that I had been feeling about what was happening in our society to make me realize that, yeah, no, it it really is happening in our society and they, they can show it. So that, that helped me feel as though I was slightly less crazy. Yeah, I agree. That book's fantastic. Uh, who is your most influential role model? Probably Martin Luther King, um, just with what he did with the civil rights movements, being an attorney, and also then his, you know, coming from a Christian family and really pushing his faith and relying on that. That's, that is what has gotten me through some of the darkest moments of my life. Um, and so I would definitely say probably him. The next question is, what organizational tool can you not live without? My laptop or my cell phone? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Technology's really taking over our lives. Um, Unfortunately. (laughs) What do you do to relax or chill out? I swim laps right now. COVID forced me to stop running because of the whole mask situation. So I have gotten into swimming and I don't swim like a normal swimmer. I swim with a snorkel. So I don't think I'm that cool, but you know, I can do a mile swimming laps and being under the water really focuses me in just being in myself and focusing on breathing, which is sort of, I guess, a meditation process. Um, I can't, you know, just breathing in and out and going with the flow of the water. And so that's really allowed me to have just a quiet time Um, It also allows me to get away from my children for an hour while I'm in the pool. Um, Yeah, swimming sounds fantastic. Um, 
If you could have a superpower, what would it be and why? I would love to have the ability to really hear people's thoughts um, because I think a lot of the times people say things and that's not really what they're what they're thinking. And so being able to connect in that way would be amazing. I love that. Um, what is the next ceiling you want to break? I really want to move into more uh, development side. So there's a community called Anthem in Phoenix, and it is a 30,000 home planned community. And so that's really where we're headed is to try to build communities that get us out of the boxes. So not having childcare and assisted elderly care together, but um, being more in a, in a circular village style of community that would join us back together. And so that's that's my next big thing is to look at how to move more into the planned community side. And that is our show, Mind the Ceiling. And here, we don't mind the ceiling because it's meant to be shattered. We are here for you, so please subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to us, follow us on social media, and share us with your friends. We'd love to hear from you, so hit us up on Instagram to ask our guests some questions or just celebrate your successes with us. We're here to cheer you on along your journey. And with that, what makes us excited about the future? You know, right now, um, people are starting to catch up to the things that I've been talking about for years. I mean, when I first met you, I was talking about sustainable housing, right? And now, now there are terms for things that there weren't even terms for 10 or 15 years ago in the, the concepts that a lot of us have been discussing. So it, the possibilities and the fact that people are finally opening their minds to what's happening around them and not just in the sustainability world, but right about the social justice issues that are occurring within our country that have been occurring, but have been really under the radar in this we're a colorblind society type thing. We've got affirmative action. Isn't it all OK? Um, so it, that makes me excited that, you know, there is hope for change and that there I can be a part of that. 